Welcome to our special event today, co-hosted by Code California and AGL. I'm Bill Maley with the AGL Association. We are a nonprofit that aims to transform government and help it modernize through shared knowledge and community building. Today we have a special guest, Shani Imanovin, Director of Innovation for the California Health and Human Services Agency. Uh, Shani will talk about his fascinating projects in state government and about his time working in the federal government at the U.S. Digital Services. Uh, just a reminder, we are recording today's session and we'll post it online afterwards. Please keep your microphones muted until we go to Q&A about halfway the pro program. Uh, in the meantime, please feel free to post your questions in the chat field at the bottom of your screen. Uh, before we go to Shani, though, we have Angie Corarte, Assistant Secretary for the California Government Operations Agency. Angie, thank you for being here. What is Code California? Can you give us some background? Great. So Code California is a community of practitioners uh, at the state level, local level, and federal level. Uh, we're looking to partner and work with individuals that are interested in, in promoting and working in the open, mostly really following those principles. Uh, it's an attempt at building that community so that the state of California can successfully implement its open source policy, which it released in the summer of last year. And so Part of the reason why we're doing this event and we have folks like Cheney speaking on, on their cool work that they're doing is to really start growing the community of practitioners uh, to develop the best practices that the Code California Initiative has launched. So if you go to go.code.ca.gov, you'll be able to find the, the packages of, of offerings that we're starting to build together, including language on the policy that I referenced earlier, as well as the playbook, which has guidelines, best practices, uh, templates, and a few other things that um, departments and communities can reference when they're embarking on open source projects. And then it also has this community as well. So I'm happy to be here with you all and looking forward to really growing this community. Bill, I don't know if we have more specific questions about Code California. Feel free to reach out to me anytime. Uh, if you have a project in mind that, um, you guys want to work on or looking to really figure out who has an interest in embarking on an open source project, let me know. We're looking for, for volunteers all the time. Thank you. So I, I do actually have a, a follow-up question or two about Code California. Um, so you mentioned the launch on December 12th and we had a number of uh, Ignite talks uh, and Shani was one of them. And um, I was wondering if you could put some context to, you know, what, um, what we're going to be talking about today with Shaney. And, you know, you obviously know his role, but uh, just how does that match what you're trying to do with Code California? Of course. Um, so typically the way that state government releases its policies, it does it in silos. So a lot of the technology policies that have been put in place mostly rely on the responsibility and within the realm of the CIOs. Um, and so part of the reason why we wanted to do the soft launch in December is to really start growing that ecosystem so that we can really uh, build projects collaborative across the different jurisdictions and not just depend on, on one specific group to really successfully implement these type of efforts. And so um, we also wanted to showcase the fact that Yes, open source is definitely connected to technology, but the first word being open, it's one of the principles that we're really trying to um, kind of disseminate across government, right? Like making sure that we are building open and collaborative organizations and that we uh, are ultimately breaking the silos within our government and across the, the different jurisdictions, but abiding by the principles of openness and collaboration, which is, kind of the brand that we're giving Code California uh, and really, again, building that community of practitioners and, and individuals that are interested in, in this type of environment. Thank you. So can you give us just a little uh, sense of uh, what to expect in the coming months uh, with Code California? Of course. So we will be doing a bit of more training for some of our state folks around open source projects. So the state folks include not just tech technical individuals, but also um, attorneys as well as procurement officers. Uh, we're looking to pilot a couple of open source efforts. So again, if you do have uh, an open source project that you are interested in or would like to participate in, 
uh, you can definitely get involved. I think Cheney, um, through the Office of Innovation, has been thinking about doing something with open opportunities. I don't want to steal his thunder if he wants to mm. talk about it later, but that's one of the things that I'm looking forward to. And then more events, really, I, I think it depends. Um, uh, for us to be able to successfully grow this community, we need to have consistent engagement, right? Whether it's through events like this or online. And so I'm hoping that we'll be able to continue to have engagements like this and maybe one more in person um, so that we can continue to grow that community. Terrific. Well, thank you. Uh, and are you going to stay with us the whole time or, um, or, or do you have to leave midway I, through? I'm planning on staying here the whole time. Great. Uh, so Thanks. we'll um, make sure uh, to remember to ask a few questions once we get to the Q&A about halfway through the program. So Shani, thank you for taking the time today. I know you're really busy with the Office of Innovation for California Health and Human Services Agency. Uh, was wondering before we get into that and your, your work there and what's going on, um, if you could just give us a little background on your career. I know you spent some time at U.S. Digital Services. Uh, I heard something about you doing a uh, reverse ladybird uh, somewhere along the way in your career. So is there any, <laughs> give us a little background. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I appreciate the chance to be here virtually and to speak. Um, it's always fun to reach out um, and engage more of the community because we're going to need everybody's help as we try to forge forward with California. So um, I'm really glad that this community exists and um, you know, really am honored to be a part of it, no, no joke. Um, so I have a weird background. I started off in private industry at a company that got bought by Lockheed, um, which introduced me to the federal government. I moved uh, after going to uh, undergrad at Stanford and went to move to Washington, D.C. for a job. Ended up uh, getting caught up in the year 2000 uh, dot-com bubble. So I was like, oh, I'll hide out in academia, which is a good place to hide out when uh, you're job hunting. So I went to um, Georgetown, and that's where I was working for this company that got bought by Lockheed. Ended up on the Office of National Drug Control Policy campaign, which uh, introduced me to the good work that the government can do. Um, I come from a long line of state employees. My mom's been a state employee um, in the state of California for 50 years. In fact, she was the first African-American woman to become an executive in the state, which is awesome. Um, but I always told myself I would never work for the government because it was boring. So <laughs> unfortunately, I got the bug uh, seeing some of the good things that the government can do, or fortunately, maybe. And um, so from there, I got a full-time job at uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, as the web team lead, and that is was interesting because the organization was off the internet when I first joined them uh, due to a litigation. So we were focused on intra and building up capacity inside of Indian Affairs. So when we finally got reconnected to the internet, we leapfrogged a few different technologies, which was actually really cool, and introduced us to Agile. So we were one of the first federal agencies to start using Agile as a development methodology for our um, for our building our website and building web-based applications. Um, what was weird though was that uh, we were doing Agile, but we were doing it, you know, um, we were doing what Agile Fall. We were, we were breaking our work into two-week sprints. Didn't know about product, didn't know any better. Um, but it was 2008, 2009, so it was really new. Um, so, you know, looking back, I'm impressed that our boss even let us try it. <laughs> um, so from there, um, I moved to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau when it was about a year old and it was this shiny new thing on Capitol Hill. That was cool because CFPB was agile from the start. So that's where I got an, um, an introduction to how project management could work with project management in a government space. Um, I'll go into that a little more in a minute, um, but that was an important education, uh, painful yet important. Um, then I uh, went to U.S. Digital Service for the last year of the Obama administration, and I was working on the um, uh, Homeland Security team, and my product was the um, mobile version of the um, um, naturalization application. So people applying for naturalization, um, but this was a great introduction to user research guiding design because their first um, efforts were all around laptop, having a scanner, scanning in your documents. Um, but after doing research, and uh, Dana Chisnell, who some of you might be familiar with her name, she's the brains behind uh, 
the uh, Anywhere ballot. She, um, her nonprofit helped create the more user-friendly ballot that we see now um, and voting machines across the country. Uh, Dana pushed Homeland Security at the time to really do better user research. And what they ended up doing was learning that most of their clients did not have laptops, did not have scanners, but they had mobile phones. Moreover, they had smartphones. So they retooled the product to work well on mobile devices. And I think that made it really successful. If they'd gone with their original plan, um, they would have just forged forth with a web-based application that worked great on a laptop with a scanner connected. But if you have a mobile device, it would have been extraordinarily frustrating. Um, so uh, at the end of my year at US Digital Service, I left a uh, you know regular government job that I could have stayed in forever. When I joined USDS, you're on year-long um, tours of duty, so I kind of left some of that security. Um, but it was good. I needed the change. So uh, at the end of my term there, uh, there was an opportunity to come to California and create the California Digital Service. So the reverse ladybird joke is that I'm from Sacramento originally. So. Uh, I did a reverse Lady Bird and came back to Sacramento to uh, <laughs> to join my um, family. They're all still here, um, but also to you know create for my you know home state what I'd seen work well in the federal space, and that was very important to me. Uh, I recruited a few other folks from USDS to join me. Um, fortunately, California Digital Service, as Angie can attest to later, doesn't really exist in the form that we thought it was going to exist. No one's fault, it's just because the hiring mechanism doesn't exist yet. There is no one two-year tour of duty. There's a nine-month special assignment that you basically cannot extend. So at the end of the nine months, I had to find a new job. Um, so I ended up uh, helping stand up the Office of Tax Appeal, which um, I worked on Motor Voter for a bit, um, which yeah, won't go too much into that one, everyone knows. <laughs> It was a good project, but it was a tougher challenge at DMV than we thought, which poor Angie is is, is dealing with right now um, and others. Um, but it's a worthwhile cause, and we will figure it out. I, I'm confident we will. Yes, um, yes we will. Uh, but the, the, the going to tax appeals was good because I saw that the methodologies um, of human-centered design, of journey mapping, worked very well. Um, when you had people who were willing to go with you. So I was able to contrast some of the experiences at US Digital Service, at DMV, at uh, OTA, to kind of think about a different way to approach bringing these foreign methodologies into state service. So then the job to become Director of Innovation for California Health and Human Services came up. Um, Seemed like it was right up my alley. I applied, was fortunate enough to be offered the position. Um, and Michael Wilkening, who is currently the Secretary of Health and Human Services, he was undersecretary at the time, um, really created the right environment for something like this to happen. And uh, not disparaging anybody else in state government, everyone's trying, but this was the right environment for me to create this office, which I'll describe in a minute. Um, Mike, was a little bit hesitant to try some of these new techniques. As he'll tell you himself, uh, when they first pitched open data to him, they described it as data hackathons, and he told them to get out of his office in no uncertain terms. <laughs> because as a um, executive in charge of data, you're worried about breaches, and hackers are the last thing you want in your data. Over time, it was explained that hacking and open data and hackathons, things like that, were really a terminology but the the mentality behind it is to create an open source conduit for people to take the data and our data government data really belongs to the people but it's to allow the people to use the data to create products and to create visualizations to create whatever that frankly we as government don't have the time the expertise or the money to create so by opening the data up to the people to do these amazing things with you actually increase the reach of the good things that government can do. So once Mike saw this, he was all in. And so he created, he started looking at what else open data and that mentality could create, um, which led to uh, hiring a Fuse Corps fellow to start the innovation efforts at Health and Human Services, a gentleman named Niles Friedman. 
And Niall's work was great because it set the foundation. So when I came in, I was able to hit the ground running. I didn't have to convince people that innovation was useful. They had already seen the benefit. I was able to scale up the efforts. So um, what does that mean? Um, I created the, the office with a lot of help um, from Mike Wilkening, from uh, Tamara Sarzintik, who some of you know is the deputy. Um, and she's been really useful in helping me think through this strategically. But the idea of the office is to introduce a two-pronged approach at innovation and state government. One approach is to deliver. So it's familiar, if people are familiar with Code for America and USDS, the idea is you build things that make a difference and show people the value in these methods. But my second tier, my second priority, and they're, they're equal in my mind, was to train state people to do this work. Especially when I was at USDS as a federal employee before, there's nothing uh, so complicated about this that federal folks and state employees can't do some of these um, techniques. Uh, the mindset and the, and the techniques and the tools are different, but there's a lot of really smart people, really dedicated people in the federal government and the state government who really want to help. And by introducing them to these tools and techniques, it makes them better at it. And then when the really skilled developers come in, either, either through you know, USDS or through 18F or through contracts, if the if government employees are better at product management, meaning they define the problem clearly, they understand the problem clearly, they have a vision for what the world looks like when the problem is solved. And if you teach the voice of the user and some of the design facing things, that a good product manager needs to know? Well, government people are already really good at policy and law. So you put those together and that's a pretty solid product manager. So by defining that set of skills as product and then pairing them with a project manager who's thinking about the contract, who's making sure that the contract is moving forward, that we're, that we're paying attention to our burn rate on that, those two folks working together make sure that you know, you're building the right thing, but you're doing it within the proper confines of the project. That's where the state, I think, is developing skill. Is project, we, we, we have some skill in project, it's product, and how those two work together without fighting, to be frank, um, is the next evolution of those skill sets. Uh, you can throw Scrum Masters in there. The Scrum Master is focused on making sure that the digital service and development team have the, um, you know, the libraries they need, the tools they need, the uh, resources, they're working at velocity. Those three folks together are a great combination of leaders who work together but have different focuses so they're not running over each other. Sure, sure. And that... Sorry to interrupt. I just had a, a, a question, a clarifying question, uh, maybe for our sure. audience. Uh, the difference between a project and a product. I was wondering if you could talk about that just a little bit, just so we, um, you know, the difference of... Uh, how you manage the two? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, sorry, I watered over that at first. Um, project is generally the effort, time-bound effort to get something done, to create some type of output. Product is generally more focused on what's the actual thing being produced. Now, the product can be a software application. It could be a widget. It could be a shampoo. It can be a whatever, but the idea of the product is it's the thing that solves the problem that you were trying to solve. Um, so where it gets confusing, I think a lot in the state and, and in the private industry as well, is that project is often conflated with product, but if you don't have somebody who's focused on the output, then project and it becomes self-serving. It becomes an effort that is just to make sure that you did work within this time within this amount of budget and within this um, scope, time, and cost are the um, tr iron triangle of product, project, excuse me. So um, having that product mentality that, oh, are you really, really solving the problem of your clients is what separates the good companies and the bad companies. There's you know, plenty of digital products out there that didn't do well um, because they didn't really solve a good problem. Thank you. So, so well, with your uh, with the Office of Innovation, 
I was wondering, uh, I remember at the event on December 12th, you talked about these six-week six assignments. Um, what, can, you, can you talk about some of those assignments? What did, you, what did you do? Who were some of the people that you worked with? You know, what departments? And, you know, you're, you're uh, presumably solving problems. Can you talk about that? Yeah, great. Yeah. So um, what I did, so we've worked with departments all throughout Health and Human Services. So there's 17 departments, I believe. And so we go and we do work in each of the departments, similar to how 18F and U.S. Digital Service will dive in and work with individual agencies or departments. We are the Health and Human Services Agency with departments underneath it. So we're an agency, but we dive into the different departments as needed. The difference with how my staff is working is I actually don't have any staff from outside. They're all state employees. And they've all been, um, I jokingly say, well, I kidnapped them from all the different departments. They're on two-year rotations with me um, where I have put them through uh, six weeks intensive training in human-centered design, facilitation, product, uh, design thinking, and a lot of soft skills around good, effective communication, uh, strength finders, another program we call Humanware, which is really breaking down communication into understanding how other people communicate so you can adjust your style. Because I knew I was going to put people in situations where they're going to sit down across the table from somebody in the department, and they're going to be like, okay, you're the cool kids from agency to tell us how we're doing things wrong. And I wanted the attitude of this department to be different. I wanted to be very humble. I wanted us to say like, nope. We're not smarter than you. In fact, we know less than you because we're not subject matter experts. All we have are some techniques and methodologies that we think will help you define the problem. Then we're gonna to prototype together to find out something that works well. So the focus on this office and our methodology has all been, uh, from an evolutionary standpoint, focused on problem definition. Because I think as the state and the federal government, we are really bad at having problem statements that are so large that it's gonna take they're too hard to tackle. You want something that's simple enough that you're going to trip on it getting out the door. It's so easy to get started. So we take these larger problems, like let's solve all nutrition problems for California, and then we focus on something a little more targeted that you can solve in a time box. So we do eight-week time boxes, uh, just so that they don't go on too long, but also to create a sense of urgency. So in that eight weeks, we might actually tackle, let's find a way to address EBT cards fraud in this one county. So you're still solving a problem related to nutrition issues, but it's a smaller piece. And then the next rotation, you solve the next piece and the next piece. So over time, you've taken a big chunk out of that problem. So um, we've done, um, so the office has only been in existence for about seven months, eight months. We've done 10 engagements. I'll give you a couple of highlights. Um, we're right now working with the Department of State Hospitals. Um, one of the, the, the project is actually being driven by a litigation. There's individuals who unfortunately are um, chemically unbalanced um, due to illness or um, other causes who are found incompetent to stand trial. So the idea is that state hospitals will take these individuals in, medicate them and give them the proper mental health treatment that they need until they can stand trial for their crimes. Um, and a lot of times the focus is on rehabilitation. So um, a lot of it is petty theft and people who are, you know, uh, unbalanced. So, but the problem is that these should be quick turnarounds theoretically. And there is a eight month to a year long waiting list. Um, and the, the, the wait is too long, frankly. So. They're trying to get that time down. So what we did is we applied our human-centered design to it, and we looked for and found multiple redundancies in the process. We've been able to cut three months out of the process already, and I'm hoping that we're going to actually find a pathway to cut even more time by the time the team wraps up next week. And none of this is using technology. Uh, what I've found is that by focusing on the human-centered design, by focusing on the, the, the problems and the workflows, we're actually finding ways to make the human process way more efficient, and then we're gonna layer technology on different. So this is part of the evolution. I want the state to become really good at problem definition and product management and human-centered design um, so it becomes habit. Once it becomes habit, then we can start doing the more complicated things of finding um, and building um, product and building code. 
Um, but I think it's an evolution. Let's not code this inefficient process. Let's really learn how to find the best way to do the human part of it. Then we'll add technology. And so far we've been really successful. Um, we did another one with Department of Rehabilitation where this one was interesting. I really enjoy this one because it, it represents a really aggressive pivot. We went in thinking that Department of Rehabilitation provides job training to folks who are either disabled or newly disabled. So it's a very important program. So if you've had an injury um, and you need to learn how to, a new career um, based on your injury, uh, we provide job training, we provide rental assistance, we provide um, clothing, interview, um, mentoring. It's a wonderful program. The central office had a presupposition that people who come into rehabilitation for these benefits might also need um, nutrition benefits from Get Cal Fresh. So the project was to go in and find a easy way to do a universal application. So folks who needed um, DOR benefits might also go to, um, while they're sitting there at DOR, get their uh, application for social services, get CalFresh benefits right there while they're sitting there, which would be great. It's like our anywhere application um, is what we're thinking about talking or calling it. However, as we did interviews and we dug into the problem, we found after doing over 40 interviews, that wasn't the problem. Most clients, when they come to rehabilitation, they're already food secure and housing secure. And you think about it, it makes sense. Maslow's hierarchy, you know, food, clothing, and shelter. You have those kind of set before you start going, hmm, what's the next thing? Okay, let me find employment. So the, what we found is that in a couple of the counties, they were already, you know, way beyond that. But the foster youth program was being used at something like 17% of its uh, potential utilization. And they found a particular county that was doing an excellent job connecting foster youth to DOR resources. So right when they hit 18 and they age out of the system, they go from being in the schools to being in a DOR program with access to job training, access to the clothing bank, access to those mentors, so they can start learning job skills, interviewing, and getting jobs right out of high school. Uh, there's no so they've eliminated some of the gap and some of the problem where folks are homeless before they and then have to climb back up to being food and, and housing secure before they get rehabilitation. They are proactive um, and they have a lot of great partnerships with the different schools, with the different social workers. So what we found was that when we were telling that county, hey, we want to scale this up, we want to tell central office, they literally said, please don't tell central office we don't want them to stop what we're doing. So what we found was a communication gap between central office and the field where they're hiding some of the work that they do because they think central office is gonna stop them. So we were like, no, no, no. So, and this is where the, the facilitation and the convening skills come in. We have them all sit down and we show them this great work and central office literally were jumping out of their chairs going, we assumed this wrong thing. Now you're showing us this wonderful program. How can we support you do more of this? to which the county people stood up and said, yeah, yeah, we did this, yeah, yeah, let's do more of this. So now we've created a better communication between the field and the central office. And now they're thinking about scaling this model up, but in a really intelligent way. What works in this county, Placer County, will not work in, let's say, Stanislaus County, because Stanislaus County is more, um, the jobs are more around the labor industry. So their job training program can't look the exact same as it does in Placer. But central office is the right group of folks to convene that because they can say, hey, this worked over there. Let's talk to you about how you can tweak it to work in your county. So that was a really wonderful deliverable. That was a very aggressive pivot from where we first started. We went from an anywhere ballot to let's scale up this really great foster youth program. A um, couple other quick examples. Um, uh, Department of Managed Healthcare, they wanted us to come in and help them use um, 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 they have a, dis a, a requirement to calculate the distance between a plan, healthcare plan provider and a patient. Well, they wanted to use ArcGIS, uh, but they had a hard time getting the license. So we thought we were going to come in and help them with a procurement problem. As we talked it and, and we interviewed them, we found that um, most of their labor wasn't really getting stuff into the, the software. Don't get me wrong, the software was a headache. Um, and they ended up getting the license um, by not through our work, through another effort. <laughs> um, 
But um, what we found was that they were spending almost 60% of their time cleaning up the data from the providers to put into the system. They didn't have a universal data intake methodology, and they were spending a lot of, uh, frankly, um, skilled staff time doing computer work, literally cleaning data and normalizing it. So what we did is we created a checklist to help coordinate the work between the attorney, the um, people who are doing the uh, support, and the providers um, and their tech folks, and having a checklist that really clearly laid out, this is what you do in this order, and this is what you expect in each step. We cut about 30% off of their process just with that checklist alone. And um, this was a wonderful quote from this project. They said, it's hard to measure this, but the redu reduction in staff frustration is unquantifiable, but the most valuable thing and worth more than any other effort we've seen. So just that difference in people knowing what they're doing, coordinating the communication is having Unfortunately, hard to measure, um, but uh, you know, just incredible benefit to the department. Um, so those are some good examples. Um, these are all human-centered. Uh, um, uh, to bring it back to open source, we're uh, borrowing, we're forking the code from uh, the federal government's open opportunities. We're building one for us, and this is going to be how people volunteer to do work related to our governance process. So for example, we have a data subcommittee that does work related to data sharing agreements. So if somebody has an hour or two to spare to help um, process a data um, uh, request or something, they can use open opportunities to sign up for it, um, donate their time, and submit their, um, their end product. So that's been really handy. True. So, yeah. Well, thank you. Those are some fascinating examples of uh, problem solving and uh, it's hard to imagine that um, state government has existed for so long without an office like yours to do exactly what you're doing but um, you touched on um, you know bringing it back to uh, open culture you know we were talking in December about uh, open source and open the culture of openness within government um, I was wondering um, if you could talk about any other uh, opportunities uh, like this that might exist, uh, other sort of Code California type communities of practice that um, you see potential for? Yeah, um, yeah, great question. Um, I'm hoping that the state becomes more and more open and we're pushing a couple of things that I hope help. Um, yeah, the, the address the you know uh, 300 pound elephant in the room or no that's the wrong I'm, I'm mixing my metaphors to <laughs> address the elephant in the room there is the office of digital digital innovation um, however we don't know what that is yet and for anybody who's like rushing ahead and thinking that that's the solution yeah it's an awesome idea where we're really excited about it but it it hasn't been through funding there is no thing that exists yet. So keep it on you know the back burner, and you know we 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 know good things are going to come of it. But in the meantime, um, you know keep focused on 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 what what you're doing, and we have some opportunities um, to have folks from outside of government engage with us. Um, this uh, work group, uh, the AGL, is another great way. The Code California is another great way. Um, my office is starting what we call a speaker series. We're hoping to start it um, in mid to late March or early April at the latest. And that's a monthly, excuse me, a weekly series where we have people from outside government come and speak to Health and Human Services. And we're hoping to open it to anybody who wants to come, really. Um, but to have people come and talk about wonderful things in private industry, in other government efforts, um, local, county, um, but to share knowledge and skills in this really open, friendly, hour-long conversation, kind of like how we're doing now. Our speaker series will feature a different speaker every week, but we have folks from the health industry and folks from the tech industry lined up, and we'd love to open it up to folks in uh, you know, other state government, local, to talk about their wonderful successes. Um, we have a lot to learn from each other. Um, we are also setting up communities of practice. Um, right now, those are gonna be um, focused around the digital service um, triumvirate of skills. So design, 
product and engineering, we're also adding a procurement community of practice, but it's an opportunity for people to get together in a non-work quasi-social um, situation where they can come and talk and learn from each other about what methods uh, have they found that work well, what methods that they'd like and skills they'd like to grow. Um, and we think that this is a good place to start engaging um, not only folks from different departments and different agencies, but also folks from outside who are interested in learning more about efforts. Um, and again, this is um, ideas that we've been talking about at the agency over the past year, and we're just now getting the ability to stand these up. Um, it, it's, as you well know, Bill especially, standing these things up sounds really simple, but the amount of logistics, getting people and locations and technology and everything together takes time. So that's another way that we would like to get people involved. Um, but this is an exciting time to be involved with California. It's, the, it's a wonderful culture that we're developing here. Um, it's an incredible vision coming from the newly elected leadership. Um, the, the former leadership, um, the Brown administration, also have wonderful ideas and really set the pace. And I'm excited to see the Newsom administration take this to the next step. And I'm not, you know, just fanboy cheerleading about this because I really see this as a key opportunity and a key time for us to get this right. If government starts delivering services better the way people are expecting and they deserve, we can start to fix some of the disillusionment and fracturing that we're seeing, um, especially in our political culture. And so I take this very seriously. I think we have an opportunity to uh, turn the corner and I know we can do it because we have really smart people, uh, and a lot of people on this call, who are thinking about this, who wouldn't have been, who wouldn't have been involved before. So this is a really, really exciting time. Great, well actually that's a really good segue to our Q&A. It's about 40 minutes after the hour, so uh, we promise to go out to the audience for questions. So uh, folks, uh, if, you're, if you wanna unmute and ask a question, just uh, I'll go ahead and pause and, and let folks uh, speak up. Anyone interested? Let me uh, take a look at the chat here. So um, let's see. Uh, where would the responsibility for training employees in some projects like Kubernetes and Elasticsearch or TensorFlow, et cetera? Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I got that question exactly right, but what, where are the, where's the responsibility for training employees? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I, some of that I've decided to take on as the, one of the responsibilities of the office is not only do we do the work and teach as we're doing it side by side, but this month we've actually put together a couple of short two to three hour long trainings and some of the methodologies so we can start teaching it to people, even if they're not on a project with us, just so they can get more familiar with like human centered design, um, uh, <laughs> facilitation skills, product management. Kubernetes and Elasticsearch are really key skills. Um, I was trying to put together a training where we could start teaching people Python or just an, a, a modern language just to, to debunk some of the fear and, 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 and oh my God, coding is so difficult. And it's like, no, once you learn, it, it, it's like any other skill. You can get better at it. And it, it's scary at first, but you know, once you learn that, hey, it's, a lot of development is Googling stuff and figuring out the right syntax. Once you get over that scared, you know, over that hump, it, it, you can, it, it opens up a lot of new worlds. Um, and to be honest, the, the, the more nuanced skill, like Kubernetes, understanding how to use containers, understanding how to use, um, you know, cloud resources correctly and not have to hug all your servers. Um, I really see ODI possibly, my, my wish, is that's a great opportunity for that organization to, to be a leader in, in this type of training. Because they'll have a wider view than my office can, can they can offer that more specific type of training. Um, and it can be something that people are able to use. If I can add one more point to this, and I know I'm sort of talking way too much here, um, but uh, one of the key principles in my office, the other thing that I, that I was really adamant about, is that after the training, I wanted people to be with me for two years so they could practice the skills and then go back to their home departments. That way they're kind of ruined on the old way forever. They don't want to go back to doing it the old way because they not only do they know it, but they practiced it. It's part of them. 
So it's one thing to offer training, but it's another thing to then give people the opportunity to get good at it. So that's the key is as we teach people skills like how to use a Docker container, you know, and better, you know, um, agile practices or whatever, they need to then go home and have a project where they practice it. And if we as the leaders in this aren't creating those opportunities for the people that we're training, then we're missing a wonderful opportunity. So it has to be training and practice. That's my soapbox. All right. Any other questions from the audience? So I've got another question. Uh, one of my standard questions here. Um, I was wondering if you could share, you know, books, playbooks, any anything, you know, that or websites, uh, anything that sticks out that you'd like to just um, that you that you talk about and use on a regular basis. You see your your secret sources of information. Yeah, um, there's a couple. Um, as far as skills, the USDS playbook is, is always a good place to start. Um, it's good because it's a good introduction to the methodologies and how they work in a government situation. Um, there's a couple of uh, training partners who I can't say enough good things about. There's a guy named Alan Gunn. He goes by Gunner. And his organization is called Aspiration Tech. He probably has the best facilitation training I have ever seen on this planet. And I've worked with a couple of wonderful facilitators throughout my career. Um, he taught us these skills and we use them daily. Um, another guy named Dave Viotti from Smallify, we use his human-centered design or design thinking approach. Uh, Stanford D School is another good one. Um, there's a couple other book sources that I quite like. Uh, one is the Lean Product Handbook. Um, that's a great book to read because it gives you a practitioner's level understanding of how to build how to build product. As far as culture, there's a gentleman named Adam Grant. He has a podcast with Ted. He has a few books out there. Um, his new one's called Originals. It's excellent. Um, but he's got a podcast called Work Life. I recommend listening to that because there's some principles in that that I've tried to put into my office to let people be a more self-organizing team and more flattened without it being scary. Um, there's a couple of books specifically if you want to start working in the government space. One's called uh, Hacking Bureaucracy. It's kind of an older book, but you might be able to find it on uh, Amazon. And um, again, this is going to sound like a shameless plug, but read Citizenville. Um, to be honest, Citizenville, everything in it makes sense. I mean, it's probably nothing you've heard before, but it gives you a good idea to the mentality of this administration and how they're approaching problems. So I just think it's a good sort of foundational read to um, just have the right vocabulary with folks in the government um, in this administration. Thank you. So one more question in the chat. Uh, what should vendors know before they contact you and how would you like to be pitched? Oh, that's a great question. Um, what vendors should know is a couple things. Um, you don't have to be on CMAS, but it makes things so much easier for us. I know CMAS is a royal pain in the rear, and one day I promise we will get to it, and we will make it easier to get on there. Um, but um, one of the things I've tried to do is I've tried to work more with small business because not a knock on anybody who's from you know kpmg or accenture those are great companies but i really like the idea of smaller vendors being able to work with government and get experience with government and bring fresh ideas and perspectives um, into our space um, that's why you know work with civic action civic makers aspiration tech um, you know, I'm trying to find good small companies that may have never even worked with the state before. And hey, come on in, let's work together. Um, let's try it. So I know I, I just sort of spoke out of both sides of my mouth. I said, get on CMAS, but also, hey, try to work for the state in a new situation. If you're not on CMAS, there's ways we can do small engagements with you just to get your feet wet and for us to learn how we work together. Um, Small business contract is one way. Uh, we can do small things that are under 10K as just a way for us to uh, do some discovery work together. There's multiple ways that we can do that. The best way to let yourself be known that you're out there is to um, 
engage with the community. Engage with this type of community. Engage with uh, code.ca. Um, put things on Medium. Um, you can also reach out to us, um, but we're really interested in talking to people who live and breathe modern digital service methodology. Um, you do Agile the right way. You bring your developers into design sessions. Everyone's open to design critique. Um, you do charrettes. If you know what I'm talking about, then you're the company that we want to talk to. <laughs> Terrific. Sorry, Angie, were you thinking? I think that's about right. There's different procurement mechanisms that um, we often have to expose all types of vendors, not just small vendors, on, on how we can officially work together. But I'm particularly interested in figuring out how we can leverage the open source policy and this open source collaborative space to, to find other type of engagements where we can connect. Yep. Thank you. Perfect. All right. So we are getting closer to the end of the hour. Um, if we uh, if we don't have any other questions from the audience, um, just you know, for closing, um, wondering if you want to share any career advice uh, for folks that are working in your space. You know, maybe some folks that are working in the office of uh, digital innovation, or um, you know, just uh, trying to help innovate government. What's your advice? <laughs> um, it's different advice if you are inside versus outside and trying to get in. If you're inside the government, my advice to you is to um, learn as much as you can about modern digital service delivery. Um, go to community hackathons, like go to some of these free events just to learn the people, learn the techniques, learn the nomenclature, learn how people talk. Um, read some of these great books um just expose yourself to the different way it, it, and, and i know every 10 years people are like oh this is a new thing this is a new way of working um and and that is true some of this it, you don't want to get caught up in a fad but i will say that digital service delivery is particularly the way designers developers and product people work together that ain't going anywhere that's a really solid model that got Google to where they are, Facebook to where they are. So understanding how those three roles and where you fit in work together will help you understand where what you have to contribute. And and it can and your contributions can be tremendous in this space. Um, for people on the outside trying to come in, um, <laughs> patience. <laughs> really, um, I mean, bureaucracy is its own thing, and we don't have it because we like it and we want it to be that way. Um, and sometimes bureaucracy is there because we need it to protect against um, rash decisions that could get us in trouble later. Um, and I know it sounds ridiculous, um, but as the government gets better at being okay with failing forward and trying these small things that might fail, um, then you'll get more opportunity to be involved in these like, small projects. Um, we're built to not fail and to not be on the front page of the Washington Post with, oh, you wasted $3 billion. So what, you know, and Angie will, will test this, what we're trying to shift in the mentality is, okay, let's make a $10,000 bet or a $50,000 bet, do some discovery and see if we're even solving the right problem. And if it's the wrong thing, oops, we didn't waste that much money, we didn't waste that much time, only a couple of weeks, we'll pivot, try the next thing. And as people get more and more comfortable with that mentality, we will be able to look more like a uh, private company and we'll be able to look more agile <laughs> to re overuse the term. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we have uh, one more question. Uh, will the California implementation of open opportunities uh, be open to outside agencies like Code for America brigades? Uh, oh, great question. Um, eventually, yes. Right now, no. It's in a very early pilot stage. In fact, it's only open to two departments. We're looking for volunteers to help us write the code um, because forking it from the federal space was a little more difficult than we thought because a lot of it was hard coded. Um, but once we know it works well internally, then we can open it outside. And again, this is where you have to be patient with bureaucracy. Opening it internally, we have to deal with some of the union issues and to make sure if someone's doing something outside of their quote-unquote pay grade, 
that it doesn't give them an unfair advantage or an unfair disadvantage for a promotion. So then when you open it up to outside, then it's not like, well, hey, now I'm competing against somebody in the private industry. We just, these are conversations that need to be settled with HR and they're not trying to be blockers. They just want to make sure everybody has the same understanding, which makes sense. Um, so no one feels left out of the opportunity. Once we hammer those things down, then we can open it up. Um, keep your eye on it. Um, we really need people to help us within the next few months. Um, we're hoping that maybe in the next year or so it could be opened up. Um, but I don't know. Um, but the more help we get from the outside and the more exposure, the better. Okay, so any final questions? Go ahead and pause there for a second. All right, well, Shady, thank you so much for taking the time today. This has been a really great conversation, and uh, thank you to our audience for tuning in today and, and all the great questions. We are going to post this conversation online, so watch for that and uh, check out our website, uh, agilegovleaders.org. Sign up for AGL's newsletter and, and become a member uh, of AGL Association. Thank you again. Uh, really appreciate your time today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. I hope it was interesting. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good day, everybody.